Welcome to Gritability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. I'm your host, Adam Clausen. I was serving 213 years in federal prison when I met my beautiful, talented, incredibly creative co-host, Ro Clausen. Good morning. Hey, it is great to be back here with you. This is a continuation of our last, excuse me, of our last episode. I am turning the tables back because Ro took the lead and was interviewing me about the origins of fitness, kind of how I got um, really into it, how it transformed my life. And I want to turn the tables back and bring the attention back on you because this is our shared passion, right? It's what brought us together and we both, you know, have our own stories of how that passion developed. So I want to delve a little bit into today about how you got started, um, where that passion for fitness came from, what was that spark, what ignited it and kind of, uh, leading up to, to where we are today. Yeah. I love this. I could geek out on this all day. So I never really had a passion for fitness. When I was little, I had really bad asthma. So I was never really allowed to play sports because it was sports induced and it was cold induced. And when you put those two together and I lived in New Jersey, so obviously sports were outside in the cold, my asthma was really bad. So I wasn't allowed. And I was an Italian girl in New Jersey. I grew up on pasta and bread and carbs. And I, at points, got chubby. When I went to college, I gained the freshman 30 and I was dating this guy at the time and we were on the beach. It was me, my girlfriend, Melissa, her boyfriend and his friend who I was dating. And what I didn't know was when I went in the water, the guy I was dating told my friend, Melissa, I love her personality, but she's a little chubby. Could you bring her to the gym with you? Maybe just introduce her to the gym because I don't want to break up with her, but I'm not like all that physically attracted to her. And so I didn't know that at the time, and Melissa didn't tell me at that time, but she introduced me to step class. This was okay. back in the 90s when that was like the hottest thing. Well, I fell in love from my first class. I loved everything about it. So I kept going, and I developed this passion for learning more about this. And I was watching... My body changed and I loved it. And Melissa stopped going, which is funny, but that's how, where it really started. So it was a negative that turned into a positive for me. Well, that was a step class. Yeah. And I know it evolved into much, much more than simply steps. How did you make that transition? Okay, that's where you started. But like, <laughs> clearly, and, and we've talked about this previously, you were competing like to get from a step class to competing to ultimately winning some very serious awards. How do you get from there to there? That's a good point because I knew nothing about it except for the step classes I was taking. And then I started rollerblading and this was through college. After college, I moved home and I wanted to continue working out. So I joined this little personal gym in my tiny little hometown, my sister was working the front desk and I would go in and I would work out. I had no idea what I was doing. So I would maybe like do dumbbell curls and then go on that. Remember the pre-core machine back in the day? I would go on that. The what? The pre-core. I think that's what it was called, right? It had the arms and the legs that moved. You know what I'm talking about? The, the cardio? Arm? Oh, like. You know, I don't know what it's called now. Like an elliptical machine. Elliptical. What did I call it? Pre-core? Is, maybe yeah. that's the brand that made it. I don't remember. Been, sure. But that's what I did. Okay. And I wasn't seeing any changes. I wasn't eating any differently. Well, the owner of the gym was a bodybuilder and his girlfriend did figure competitions back then. So they asked my sister, they wanted like a little protege. So they would train her for free because she worked there and they said, we want to do, we want to get you into competitions. So she was like, okay. And then she asked me, will you do it with me? Because I don't want to do it by myself. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I said, Sure because I wanted to learn more about it. I kind of knew that I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew everything at the same time, you know, young and dumb. So 
we started training with them. They didn't help us with our diet. They just trained us. So three weeks before this show that we were absolutely not ready for, the only thing we did was train with them and bought $500 bikinis for the stage. We were not near stage ready. We both get strep throat. And at this point, we're getting into what they call peak week, where you have to drop your carbs and drop your water. And they were going to peak us without doing our diet beforehand. Makes no sense. But we both had to back out because we had to get on antibiotics and rest and all of that stuff. And there wasn't enough time to peak. So she was like, I'm done. This is stupid. I don't like this. And I was like, I'm all in. I love this. I was bit by the bug. So I went online. Back then, it was there was no social media. It was all those forums where you would ask a question, and then people would comment in and answer. And I just studied them. And I would read all of the little questions, and I would read all the answers. So I've always been able to go into work and get all my work done really fast. So that's what I would do. I would go into work. I would get all my work done within an hour or so. And then the rest of the day, I would just study these forums and learn everything I could about back then it was fitness and it was more in the competition space, but I just absorbed it all like a sponge. I loved it so much. I want to go back to what you said. It was that spark. What was it that attracted? Because obviously you and your sister had very different responses. So what was that spark? What was it? about, um, I, I, I guess, the introduction to this. What got you excited? So I've always been really into your body. I went to school for sports medicine. I loved anatomy and physiology. So I think the spark with fitness was that I could use all of that knowledge about anatomy and physiology, and I could make all of these tweaks, and I could see them in real time happening in my body. And I would always say, like, I'm my own science project. Back then, it was not in a healthy way. I would use supplements and super supplements to change my physique, but I just loved knowing that I could control that. Mm, it sounds like a control issue there. Like what, what role did that play? You having that control? So I think it's so weird. I have a lot of control issues within myself. And this goes way back. My mom told me that she remembers me trying to diet as early as she could remember. And this goes back to 11 years old is when I remember trying to manipulate and diet. I had no idea what I was doing, but trying to just control things and figure out how I could manipulate my body and manipulate what I was putting into it to get the results that I wanted. Where that stems to, I have no idea, but it goes all the way back to 11 years old. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so how do you get into uh, competing? Because that first competition didn't work out, hit the reset button, you're all in. How do you then get on that path and, and really start taking this seriously? I'm on these forums and I'm reading everything and I'm learning so much. And I'm like, I think I got this. So I wrote myself my own diet and I picked a show and there was this girl in the forum that I met because you could do like they call it DMing now back then it was PM personal message each other. And you could send these messages to each other's inbox. And there was a girl who was like 20 minutes from me in New Jersey. And we decided we were going to pick a show and do it. We were going to not even meet beforehand. We were just going to train our own way and do it. So I picked the show and my diet was so stupid. I was eating oatmeal and eggs every meal for five meals a day because I knew I needed to eat every couple hours and I knew oatmeal and eggs were good. I had the carbs, I had the protein. It was wrong. So their owner of the forum at this time was a woman who, she was a bodybuilder. She went by the name Torchy back then. And she did this full time because she had gotten hurt on the job. She broke her neck and she couldn't do bodybuilding mm. anymore. So, and she couldn't work at that time. She was on workers comp. And I was like, listen, if I send you my pictures, can you at least just tell me if I'm on the right track? Cause I really have no idea what I'm doing. So I sent her my pictures and she's like, okay. She said, what are you eating? Who's doing your diet? And I told her what I was eating. And she was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> You're not going to be ready for a show in six weeks. She said, I'll coach you. And I'll do it for free, but you have to promise me two things. You're going to listen and do exactly what I tell you to do and don't do anything else. Don't waste my time. 
Number two, you will not listen to anybody else because there are a hundred different ways that you can go about getting to show day, but you can't nitpick a little bit from me and a little bit from this person because the science, not it's not going to match. So my theories aren't going to work mixed with their theories. And I was like, of course. And I did exactly what she told me to do. And she was amazing. She was an old school bodybuilder. So it wasn't the healthy way to do it, but she got me stage ready. And I won, I think I was third place on my first competition. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. First competition, third place. Yeah. All right. So I'm just making an assumption here. Third place, you're up on stage. Now you're getting, that's the positive reinforcement. If in my mind, like that's the push to keep you going. So where'd you go from there? I, it was, <laughs> I loved everything about it. I knew, cause remember going back to 11 years old, I could do this. I was good at this. That girl that I met, she quit in three weeks. She's like, I'm done. I'm out here. I can't do the diet. I don't want to do the diet, but I loved everything about it. So from there, including being on stage and that show presence and the stage presence, I mean, I just loved it all. So from there, I kept going. I did six, six shows in three years. I won Miss Fitness New Jersey. That was incredible. But I didn't even allow myself to celebrate that. Coming off of stage, I took what the judges told me, where I could improve. At that point, I had qualified for nationals. So I was like, okay, now I need to figure out how I am going to get my physique ready to compete at nationals as fast as I possibly can. They wanted me to get my shoulders bigger. They want, they had a whole bunch of different suggestions for me. So I got a new coach. She was up in Canada. She was starting to prep me for this. Now this goes back to what you said in the last episode about how you were kind of binging and eating everything. I was in the off season. So she wanted to bulk me up, put muscle on me. But in the meantime, I went from I think I was like 110 pounds on stage. Within three months, she had me up to 165, 170 pounds. I had never been that big in my whole entire life. I'm 5'3", and I just had so much extra weight on me. I couldn't breathe. And she had me on this diet where it was healthy food, but I was eating a ton of it. And one day a week, I was allowed a cheat day. I would get up. I would set my alarm to get up at six o'clock in the morning. I would hoard food all week, get up, start eating candy bars, go back to sleep, get up, eat breakfast. I was like, oh my God, but I had to keep eating. I had to get it all in before I went to sleep that night. And it was so unhealthy, but I didn't care because I had a goal. I needed to be on the national stage at a certain weight, looking a certain way by a certain date. So I was going to do anything she told me to do. Well, in the meantime, like you said, I'm still smoking cigarettes. I'm still going out drinking, partying with my friends. It's the off season. I can. So I'm at a party one night. This is so embarrassing how I got this injury that ended my career. Like people are like, oh, were you in the gym? No. I was at a party. It's an after party. There's this little guy that comes in all like, I don't know, geeked out. And he was like, can you do splits? I bet you can't do splits like me. And he jumps up in the air and he does a split. And I'm the girl. Don't tell me I can't do something because I'm going to prove you wrong. I've never done a split in my whole entire life. I'm wearing a pair of jeans. I'm not warmed up. I'm like, yes, I can. And I jump into an attempt to do a split and I feel a tear down the back of my leg mm. and I tore my hamstring. And from the, and it was a bad tear. So I went to go see my coach that Monday and I'm like, I'm hurt. And he's like, he used to coach um, gymnasts. This was my, so I had my diet coach in Canada and this was my training, my physical coach. He did my, uh, my workouts. And his wife was, she was a professional IFBB pro or NPC pro. And she was a gymnast her whole entire life. And he was her coach, her gymnast coach way, way, way back. So he's like, all right, I've seen this before. You're fine. You're going to rest for six weeks and then we're going to keep prepping you for your show. In those six weeks, first of all, it was really hard for the first like two or three weeks. I'm like, what am I going to do with my time, right? I'm itching to get in a workout, but I can't. He's like, don't even do upper body because you're going to be pushing with your legs even to get the weight up. So I did nothing. But after three weeks, I'm like, all right, I can get used to this. And I started getting lazy. And then I started getting all of these injuries back to back to back because all of the dieting and overtraining was kind of coming to a peak at this point. I had a decision to make. Am I going to keep going? Am I going to heal and do more damage to my body? At that point, 
I was going into the gym, but I wasn't working out. There was a group of us that trained at Gold's. And there was this guy that we worked out with, and his, and his girlfriend did one, one show. And her doctor told her, because when you get to a certain point as a woman, I think it's like between 13 and 10% body fat, you stop getting your period. Your body protects itself because it can't hold a baby. It can't nurture a baby. You're not, you don't have enough body fat on you. He said the more times that happens, it happened to her once, the less likely you are to have a baby. I always knew I wanted to have a baby. This was my sixth time doing that. Now, if I did, if I went towards, you know, my national career and then tried to go pro, this was going to happen over and over and over again. I had all these injuries and I decided that at that point I'm done. As much as I loved it, my whole identity was wrapped into being I call it fitness competitor because people didn't really understand. And when I said like bodybuilding, they were like, what? Like, like you, like Xena, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like that. Back then, they didn't have the, it's called bikini now. It's a subsection where when you and I first started communicating through email, I called it badass Barbie because it was the only way that I knew to describe the way that I looked without looking like a female bodybuilder, which, oh my God, so much respect to those women. But I didn't want that mass on me. That just wasn't the aesthetic I was looking for. So to get back down there, I needed to really, really diet down and work hard. And once again, get between 10 and 13% body fat. And I knew I wouldn't be able to have a baby, but retiring meant losing my identity. I was the fitness chick in every area of my life, including work. I was working at a hospital at one point and I had a doctor who came up to me asking me to write his diet. He's an ER doctor operating on people all day long. And he's like, I don't know how to diet. I don't eat all day. What do I do? And I'm like, eat. You're operating on people. <laughs> people at work all day long would stop by my office. What do I do? How do I do this? And I realized, I'm sorry, I'm going like way down, but I realized that people didn't know, including myself, we didn't know about health and wellness. We knew about fad dieting. We knew how to diet for aesthetics short term. And I wanted to change that. And so I wanted to become the health and wellness guru. And to me, I learned because now, okay, now I'm researching a different way. Now I'm learning how do I keep like you did? How do I keep that aesthetic? How do I look this good? But how do I do it in a healthy way? Well, this is a great transition to go from competing and winning at such a high level, um, you know, on the verge of nationals. I mean, you, you were prepared to, to take it all the way and that injury slowed you down, caused you to, you know, reevaluate. Um, but again, just like, you know, you're saying your identity was so wrapped up in that and then to pivot and try and find a way forward, how did you manage to do that? Like what was, was there a specific turning point where you said, here's the path that I'm gonna take or was it a process and what did that process look like? It was a slow process and it all kind of culminated at the same time. You and I were starting our relationship. My mom was diagnosed with cancer. So, and you guys are learning me when something comes into my life, I'm going to do it. I'm going to dive in head first. I did it with my fitness competitions. I did it with the baby when I was learning about labor and delivery. But back up, I also did it with my mom. When she was diagnosed with cancer, I wanted to help her. I wanted to learn as much as I could to keep her healthy. And as I'm learning and researching about her, I realized it's not just for a cancer patient. I wanted to be healthy prior to getting any kind of illness. I wanted to help my whole entire family and people coming to me before they were coming to me because they were sick and they needed to reverse this. So that's really how I dove into it. And I just started learning and tweaking things here and there. And then, you know, it snowballs. Oh, I, I believe me. I know. <laughs> And it was really, it was our conversations, I, I guess, throughout this period. Um, you know, having the shared passion is what brought us together, but then really being on that journey, that exploration together. Uh, I know, you know, you have such a passion, especially on the nutrition side. 
And that's the area where I hear most people, where people struggle the most trying to figure that out um, because there's just, it's, it's so dynamic. And as you said, to look historically, to look to a medical professional, ER doctor, here's someone that you would assume has some, has some knowledge here of nutrition. This is a guy who spent a lot of time in school learning about all things, supposedly all things health related. Um, clearly that's not the case. Not at all. I learned through that job. So the job I was working at that point, I was working at a hospital and I was a liaison between Seton Hall University and St. Michael's Medical Center, where the third year medical students were coming through to do their rotation in an urban area because they have to do them in different areas, urban, rural, suburban, to like check those boxes to graduate. So I used, oh my God, I love this. I used to sit in their medical lectures and I learned so much. Through that I learned, and that ER doctor, they got, at least back then, an hour and a half, one hour and a half of nutrition during medical school. Think about that. So I learned that food is medicine, right? I'm watching the doctors kill my mother with chemical medicine. I'm like, I can, I can do this. I can help prevent this or at least keep us all as healthy as possible with food. Mm, wow. Well, I know that you made some major, major dietary changes and, you know, always comes back to the fact whenever we're talking nutrition, um, so many negative connotations around diet. And this goes back to what you said early on as a child, you were already focused on dieting, right? And I think a lot of young women to this day struggle, struggle with proper nutrition. And can you talk a little bit about the difference between dieting and eating healthy? Oh, I love this. I have tried every fad diet, yo-yo diet under the sun. I tried Atkins. I tried, <laughs> there's this funny story that my sister too. So my best friend and I, when we were probably 11 years old, we're like, oh, we're going to do the Atkins diet. No carbs. Cool. We get to eat bacon. So we're both there like a week into no carbs and we throw some bacon in the microwave. So healthy, right? And we're like trying to have this conversation with my sister, Elena. So my best friend, Mary says, check the bacon to Elena. And we're like, we're trying to sit there and have a conversation. I'm like, yeah, check the bacon. And we must've said, check the bacon like 15 times in this one conversation because we're starving and all we're eating is bacon at this point. Yeah. So we joke to this day, Mary's still my best friend and the three of us will be like, uh, check the bacon. Did you check the bacon? But we did that. I did, um, paleo, vegan, you name it. I tried it. And I realized that cutting out full food groups of full groups of food never really worked for me. Cutting out time frames of food, like intermittent fasting, it works for some people. And yeah, in the moment I could make it work for my body, but it never worked for me long term because eventually you're going to eat a carb. Eventually you're going to eat breakfast. And then that snowballs into breakfast every day and carbs every day or whatever it is. And I used to have to count macros or calories at certain points in these diets. And I hated it. Like I felt like I was in prison. I had to write down and math is not my forte, as you know. So I couldn't even figure out how to calculate like 30 grams of carbs and 150 calories. And I hated every second of it. I could do it for two days because I was like really into it. And then I'm like, I'm over this. This is so stupid. So instead, I just learned what foods are healthy what foods I really should not be eating, how much of each. And through bodybuilding and through working with so many coaches for so long, I learned how to eyeball things. And to this day, one of my favorite things to do on this planet is to ask somebody like, what's your favorite comfort food? What's your favorite unhealthy food? And they'll tell me, and I'm like, I have a healthy version of that. And you can attest, like, it's good. I can attest, even the green pancakes, even which the green pancakes. I, I was reluctant, right? Until I, in, until I finally tried them. Behind my back, and I call you, <laughs> <laughs> sneaking one off of the baby's plate. Ah, uh, and you have impressed me, surprised me 
with so many different healthy variations. I, I know that that's something that you love to do. You love to take those, those different historically um, comfort foods, as you said, and find a way to make them healthy. And we have this conversation all the time because there's just so many negative connotations around dieting. And when we talk about the past, everything that I heard from, you know, leading up to competition is dieting, like very restrictive. And I'm looking at you now, you look phenomenal. Thank you. And people can't even see the full picture right now. Um, if you could see the whole picture here, wow. The abs, I mean, I had a baby not that long ago and people comment daily when they see us, when they see us working out, they're like, oh my God. And that's a testament to what you figured out with nutrition. It's the key, right? And, and I'm going to say, I'm a testament. I'm not going to take my shirt off, but... Although I wanted you to do this episode <laughs> without it. <laughs> we thought it might be creepy, though. I credit, I credit you. I mean, you're the one, like, as much as I love to cook, you've really kind of, like, taken... Because I, I know you love to cook. You cook so well, but I do strong arm you. You do strong arm me. Sorry. But I, I can't be upset about it. Because one, you love to do it, and, and I love to just watch you, you know, be in your element. But the other thing is that I see the results. So I'm seeing the results both on myself as a man um, against all of those, you know, conventional wisdom. Hey, you hit a certain age, you know, things start to slow down, and, and you can't have a certain aesthetic. You can't perform a certain way. So I look at it... For, I'm living proof of, you know, I'm the results of us living a certain way. And I look at you and I mean, you're showing it off today with the, look at the arms, look at the guns, like you're amazing. So clearly all of that knowledge, all of that experience, you've distilled it down and made it simple. It's simple. Like it's not complicated for us. We eat out, we eat at home. I don't ever, ever feel like I'm missing out on anything. What do you say to those people who are still stuck in that frame of mind? And I think this hits women a lot harder that they're stuck thinking, I have to diet, meaning I have to deprive myself. Oh, I love this question too, because first of all, I say to those women, my heart is with you. I was in that prison and it is like, I am such a foodie. I love, we love food so much that thinking back to the day where I had to eat literally bland chicken, broccoli, and count my grains of brown rice, very minimal, is torture. I would wake up in the middle of the night with hunger pains. I eat so much more now, and I look so much better now, and I work out really hard, but a lot less than I was three hours a day on the, what did I call it, the pre-core thing? <laughs> and there is an easier way. I promise you there's an easier way. You don't have to suffer like that. Food should be fun. And we talk about this all the time. There's that mentality of on, off, all or none. I have to just deprive myself all week for one cheat day. And I'm telling you right now that works short term, but the damage that that does to your body, I would have those cheat days where I would go to sleep, set my alarm, wake up at six o'clock in the morning. It takes three days for your body to work all of that glycogen, glycogen out of your muscles that you're going to crave hardcore for three days. Do you have cravings now? The way we no, eat? Me never. neither. Me neither. And we don't do that bulk and that cut anymore. So to those people that are in that vicious diet cycle, first of all, figure out what healthy foods you do like and what you don't like. Like your mom called us the other day. I felt so bad for her. She was like, oh, I'm chucking, um, choking down yogurt. I don't really like it, but I know it's good for me. And we hung up the phone. I'm like, how are we going to help her with breakfast? Because you shouldn't have to choke down foods that you don't like or bland foods because you want to stay healthy or lose a couple of pounds. Mm, so true. And I'm going to add the other component to this, right? Because the first part is getting over developing the mindset, right? Gritability. That's what it's all about, right? Having that positive mindset, um, 
being able to do those things that are seemingly difficult, right? Making major life changes. Like if you're someone, you grow up in a big Italian family, right? Like the family, much of that interaction revolves around meals. Those meals maybe aren't always the most healthy options. So for a lot of people, the difficulty there is, you know, getting over like, here's my connection to my family. This is how we spend time together. This is how we show our love and appreciation. So the first part is getting over the, the mental component yourself. But the second thing, and I would say that this is equally as challenging for people is the feedback from others. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we hear this all the time. How do you, how do you suggest that people, you know, face that like, Oh, you're one of those people or, okay. Oh my God. I can go in so many different directions with this. So I remember I was competing one time and I'm on like the bland chicken rice broccoli diet and my neighbor was over and he thought he was being sweet, but they were eating this delicious looking chocolate fudge cake. Now the thought of that, I'm like, oh, the thought of the taste of that sugar in my mouth. But back then, all I wanted was a bite of it. And he's got this huge smile on his face. And he's like, don't worry, Ro, this is disgusting. As he's taking bites, enjoying the hell out of it. And I was like, come on, man, like, don't do me like that. Tell me how good it is. But also, I remember being Jersey diner, right at the diner and my friends not wanting to order the fries that they would have ordered if I wasn't there and like guilting themselves into eating a salad. And I hated that. But on the other hand of it, misery loves company, right? So big family, they're like, oh, just a bite, right? And we're mm -hmm. in two weeks, we're going back to New Jersey for Christmas. My brother owns a restaurant and he can cook. Don't think I'm not going to eat some of his pasta. But here's the thing, indulge when in, in those times, and we say this all the time, like I'm not going to quote indulge on some really cheap milk chocolate. It's not going to do it for me. Every once in a while, will I indulge on a piece of Godiva? Of course. Like I'm not going to indulge on Chef Boyardee pasta, but I am sure as hell going to have a couple of bites or a bowl of my brother's delicious homemade pasta once a year. And it's going to be good. But also in those moments when I'm just at a restaurant and I'm ready to order. And it's a choice between a bowl of pasta or what we traditionally eat, which is still delicious to me, but it's not like that comfort food from my childhood. I know if I eat that bowl of pasta, just eat a bowl of pasta, I know how I'm gonna feel the next day, the next three days. And I associate that now, and it takes a while to get there, but I know I'm going to feel sluggish. I know I'm going to be tired. I know I'm not going to give my best during my workouts. And that's what I can, that's how I associate it now. And it takes a long time to get there, but you just get to make a choice every time you're going to order. Like, I know I'm going to feel like shit after eating what I'm going to eat in New Jersey. And that does, it's not to say I'm going to eat to the point where I feel disgusting and I have to unbutton my pants. We don't do that anymore, but I'm going to feel like crap probably after that big bowl of fiocchi. And that's a choice I get to make in the moment. And it's worth it for me. Do I do that every time we go to a restaurant? That's not worth it for me. Okay. Well, well put. I'm going to confess something here because, you know, some of these are strategies like we do, we go to a lot of different places and to be invited, say, to someone's home, right? Where they're cooking and you want to be conscious of it. You don't want to make people uncomfortable. So there are challenges within that, you know, and some people can get very defensive, right? As you make changes in your life that are the best decisions for you, and we talk a lot about this, this is where gritability comes in, right? Because the feedback or um, some of the things that people are going to say and do that are a reflection of their own insecurities, like you said, just, well, just have this piece of cake. Like there's no harm in it. They want permission yeah. to do it themselves and they're feeling some kind of way because you are choosing not to indulge, so to speak. Um, and that's going to make people uncomfortable. So that's where the mental fortitude comes in. Like you have to be strong in your position. Now, my confession is this, that 
you and I will have a conversation if we're headed to a birthday party. There are certain times, and birthdays are one of them, where I know there is going to be a birthday cake or something celebrating that person. I can say in all sincerity, like even right now, the thought of, of cake, because we have so little exposure to sugar or any sort of processed foods, like it, it doesn't, it not only does not sound appealing, it almost makes me nauseous. It doesn't taste good after you've ha not had it for so long. It's overpowering. Yeah. But if we're going to someone's birthday, I'll take the, the slice of, of cake simply because I don't want that person, especially on that day, to feel some kind of way. And I know, especially the people in our circle who, you know, still indulge, still, you know, choose to eat a certain way, when they see us take that piece of cake, it actually means more to them. They're like, oh, wow, I know how healthy they are. I know how clean they eat. They're going to have a piece of cake on my birthday. Like, it means something to them. So I'm conscious of all these things. Maybe, I, maybe I'm overthinking it. I think it's respect. I don't think you're over, or maybe I'm overthinking it with you. I'm not sure, but I'm not going to go to somebody's house for dinner and not eat what they cooked for us because I don't eat that. Come on. Like, I'm going to eat it. I'm going to enjoy it. And that's what I think we were saying. That's the point we're making is in certain moments, go for it. And then get right back on your normal, healthy lifestyle, not diet. But you know what I thought your confession you was? What? How I always make you take it for the team in those instances. <laughs> so remember when I was pregnant and there was this adorable hostess at a restaurant that you knew from work and she was so sweet and she sat us in like this special booth and she was so excited to have her people wait on us and she took care of us. When I was pregnant, the taste of sugar made me nauseous. Like I could not stand that taste in my mouth and it, it was just bad. So she brings out, she was so excited, this gorgeous piece of, it was cake with like fudge on top and she had this writing for us on top, congratulations, because I'm like out to here pregnant. And I looked at Adam and I'm like, you're gonna have to do this for us. <laughs> and I made you eat that cake <laughs> and I do it to you all the time. I know people are watching this like, oh, you guys are crazy. We are. He made you, eat, or you made him eat a piece of cake. Like, oh, the torture, right? Like if, if that's the worst thing. But, but here's the, th sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. So here's the thing. I am a former sugar junkie. Like it couldn't get sweet enough. I don't know if everybody knows Italian pastries, but do you know what a Napoleon is? Mm, absolutely. Oh my God. There is so much sugar in there. Like it's sugar on sugar on sugar. And then the top of the icing is just like, it's unbelievable. Those were my favorite. It never got sweet enough for me. I used to eat white chocolate because I wanted it sweeter. Mm. So I'm telling you that to say that if I'm at the point where sugar tastes disgusting to me, I promise you, you're hearing this and you're like, those two are crazy. Sugar is the most delicious thing on the world, in the world. But like, it's, it's chemicals. It's not. Once you cut it out for so long, and I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you, I have honestly gotten to the point where I eat something with sugar in it now and I'm like, oh, it's gross. That reminds me, because I used to use this all the time. I actually had, um, I don't remember where I got it. I got this while I was in prison. It was a printout and it showed the molecular structure of sugar next to cocaine. Few, I want to say it's a few molecules away. One. It's one molecule. One molecule of, yeah. it's a nitrogen molecule? I don't remember. Is it? what? I'm not sure. The, the science, you know, um, the chemistry behind it, I'm not exactly sure, but I know that it is so close. And to me, it was like, that's it. Well, the point there, the science is that it's that addictive. Exactly. It's as addictive as cocaine. And, and hey, I mean, that's the reality. And for us, um, and maybe I should add this in here, you know, for me, me living healthy means, you know, I, I chose to give up smoking, drugs, alcohol, all of those things a long, long time ago, many, many years ago, 2005. I gave those up and it took me a while to realize that sugar was another one of those chemicals that was having the same negative impact on me. And when I chose to, to just like I did with letting go of those other um, aspects, those other elements, 
I realized a dramatic increase in my health. Sugar, inflammatory effect, linked to all sorts of disease, dysfunction. I let go of it, I heal faster, I sleep better. I just feel better all the way around. So for me, you know, once I made that transition, it was easier not to go back because again, you know, you and I can can geek out on all of the science behind it. I believe that knowing, understanding that part of it uh, allowed me to to just get more clear on why I chose to to cut sugar out and to eat more healthy. Yeah, and so let's circle this back because you asked me before about those women who are crash dieting, and I don't know that I actually gave an exact answer. And here's the answer. So for me, it was cutting out sugar. And also, I am so sorry, ladies that like wine like me, alcohol, because alcohol is sugar. It converts into sugar in your body. And you actually, geeking out, I'm sorry, but you actually have more calories per gram of alcohol than carbs, protein, or fat. Does that make sense? Mm, Yes. Okay. So here's where you start. If you're just looking for a place to start. Where are your hidden sugars and especially liquid sugar? Because liquid sugar is going to be absorbed directly into your bloodstream as soon as you drink it, right? Because there's no fiber. There's nothing to slow it down. It's going to convert to fat the fastest. And people don't realize how much sugar they're drinking. Look at your coffee. Look at your Starbucks order. Look at your sodas. Look at your flavored waters. All of that stuff. And I'm telling you, just cut that. That's all you have to cut. And I'm not saying cut out coffee. I'm a coffee addict, but cut out a lot of that sugar in that coffee. Get the, don't get the whipped cream on top. Don't get the fancy fro, fro, frappe. I don't even know how to pronounce it or order it. But that is going to, you'll see your weight drop on the scale and your waistline change just as taking that as a first step. I promise. Excellent way to wrap things up and close this out. It's been a lot of fun to talk fitness, a lot of nutrition here. And I kind of felt like that was the direction that we would probably go because um, you are my nutrition guru. And obviously a large part of the way that we're living, what we're enjoying is the result of that. You take the lead there. I love, you know, kind of designing our workouts. It's a great balance to our relationship. And I feel so incredibly fortunate to have someone who is right on the same page with me, not only mentally, but supporting holding me accountable. I hope that you feel that I do the same for you. Oh my gosh, 100%. We just said yesterday that there are so, we take it for granted because there are so many couples who aren't on the same page and it's just always been part of our relationship. Yeah, so absolutely. Very, very fortunate. And and I would say, you know, that's what's uh, going to keep us going for the next, what, 60, 70 years that we have together yeah. that I that I'm committed to making them the best years of our life. Me too. And I just have to add that I love when I design a workout and I show it to you and you're like, Oh yeah, we could, we could just tweak this a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) And, and just like when you take the lead in the kitchen, I am perfectly happy to let you take the lead there. Love it. So it's been a fun episode. Love talking health, fitness, all things, um, wellness related. This has been another great episode of Gridability. I'm your host, Adam Clausen, and this is my beautiful, lovely co-host, Ro Clausen. And we will see you back here for another episode of Gridability.